Mercy Gway has been telling stories her whole life. From a young age, she knew she wanted to be a journalist, so she worked as a local reporter in Connecticut for years before pivoting to communications and public relations. Now she helps organizations tell their stories in doing good in this world through her anti-racist PR firm, The Narrative Project. This is Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Today, we explore the relationship between storytelling and identity. Later in the show, we talk to CBS Saturday Morning co-host Michelle Miller about her new memoir, Belonging, a daughter's search for identity through loss and love. We'll also hear from Monica Guzman, a senior fellow at Braver Angels. The group is addressing political polarization in the U.S. through conversation. Monica wrote a book about having what she calls fearlessly curious conversations in dangerously divided times. But first, Mercy Quay. She's founder and president of The Narrative Project. She's also editor and columnist with The Connecticut Mirror. Mercy, welcome to Disrupted. Thank you so much for having me. Before we talk about the narrative project and the work that you're doing to really disrupt the ways that diverse communities are understood and represented, I want to talk a little bit about you and your journey, because I think it sets up that pathway of how the narrative project as the vehicle for doing this is in alignment with you. Share with our listeners a little bit about Mercy Quay and how your approach to community and to storytelling leads you to the path you're on now. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think it's incredibly important when thinking about me to know that I wanted to be a journalist ever since I was five years old. Um, I didn't, every, everybody else in the classroom would say astronaut or fireman or right, all these other things, doctor, lawyer. And I was like uh, reporter for the New York Times <laughs> and uh, a foreign correspondent. These are the things that I wanted to be. And that was because I was influenced by my grandfather who had this deep and intrinsic sense that people are made up of stories. He would, even though we lived here in New Haven, he would he had a subscription to the, you know, Chicago, uh, the Chicago Tribune and the the Sun Times and his local paper down in Buford from Buford, South Carolina, where he was born and raised. And he would get those delivered every day. And one of the biggest things that he would say is the way to understand a people is to understand their stories. And for me, I just carried that throughout the rest of my schooling and the rest of my life, um, eventually becoming a reporter and, and, and fulfilling that dream of being a journalist, um, even though I wasn't quite with the New York Times. Uh, you know, my first job as a reporter was with the Torrington Register Citizen um, and then down with the New Haven Register. And eventually I did end up um, being featured in the New York Times, just not with the byline. So that was the closest that I got. And so my grandfather has to be proud of something. Um, I took all of that uh, sense of storytelling. And in 2015, while I was working as a communications associate for the Connecticut Coalition for Achievement Now or CONCAN, um, Eric Garner happened. And, you know, this is still really young in the Black Lives Matter movement, right? If Black Lives Matter was a new phrase that people were sort of fitting on for size. And I decided, you know what? The community is mourning right now. And having a venue to have conversations about what we're mourning, how we're mourning, would be a really great thing for us to do as a collective. And so I, had our first event, it was called Who Controls the Black Narrative? And this was in a coffee shop in New Haven that comfortably sat 25 people on a regular day. And I wasn't sure how many people were going to arrive or or show up, but um, on that day, we had around 65, 75 people pack out this small little coffee shop just to have this conversation. There was standing room only. And from there, folks, Um, were asking me to come out and have conversations that were rooted in the sort of anti-racist approach and rooted in sharing about uh, cultural consciousness. And so schools were reaching out to me and, um, uh, you know, companies were reaching out to me to host their their staff retreats. Schools are reaching out to um, have conscious conversations with 
with their students or with their teaching staff. And effectively what I realized at that point was what they really needed wasn't a one day conversation, right? Or a staff retreat where every the work pauses and we focus on something else. No, I said that the best way to do this effectively is for this to be the work. And so having been formally trained in journalism and communications at that point, but uh, having this understanding and this work of anti-racist uh, uh, cultural conversations, I said, all right, what if we combine these two to give people what they really need, which is an ongoing, an ongoing dedication to anti-racist communications? Let's talk about that phrase because it is so central to the mission of the narrative project, central to the way that the work, as you said, is done in an ongoing way and in an ethical way. But many people may not understand what does it mean to be an organization that's dedicated to socially responsible communications as well as centering anti-racist work. What does that mean for the narrative project? Yeah, so... Pivotal to understanding this is understanding the definition of public relations, right? And so most agencies will subscribe to the understand to the definition that public relations is a strategic communications process that builds mutually beneficial relationships between an organization and their stakeholders. And for us, that's a fine definition, but it doesn't go nearly far enough. And so we created and adopted uh, the definition that anti-racist public relations is the strategic communications process that builds and maintains mutually beneficial relationships between an organization and its diverse publics with the goal of ending and addressing the impacts of systemic racism, right? So everything we do is rooted in this idea that we are going to be either ending, if done successfully, we will be ending. So you know that's a long, long journey. Ending and more importantly on in the in the interim, addressing the impacts of systemic racism. And so we have 12 key issue areas that we work inside. Um, when we are working with organizations, uh, you know, organizations that most agencies would refer to as clients, but we refer to them as partners. When we're working with organizations, we say, all right, does your mission fall inside of these 12 key issue areas? These I issue areas um, stem from education, immigration, healthcare, police brutality, um, economic development, and you name it inside of these 12 key issue areas. For us, we've named these as the key levers to pull to address the impacts of systemic racism, right? And so we will work exclusively with organizations that fit inside of these 12 key issue areas or fit if they don't fit nicely inside of these squares, somehow they're in the intersections. So I just talked about who we work with, but how we do the work is also important. We ensure that our um, work staff is diverse to begin with, right? So that they can bring both their lived experience and their learned experience, how they were educated into the workplace. But then in addition to that, we have a number of methods, particularly our raised model of anti-racism, which is a method that says, all right, where do we start in research and where do we end with the execution of the campaign? And what is in between where we are auditing ourselves, interrogating the process, interacting with communities, surveying communities, so on and so forth, so that when we do execute on that final outcome, we know that it has had a buy-in from the most impacted communities. Mercy, I want to take a step back because the way that you have just laid this out seems really rational, very straightforward, very uh, symmetric in terms of how everything aligns. And I also know that you are working in a field that traditionally has not been representative, that traditionally does not include people who look like you and all the different dynamics of identity. And the idea that you're going to step into the space of public relations and communications and say, we are driven by this responsible, strategic, anti-racist commitment also means that you are in many ways challenging culture and challenging a cultural practice that at best overlooks the communities and the issues that you're you're working on and at worst can often exploit and undermine. What's the resistance that you've encountered to doing this work in this particular way 
and really elevating voices that traditionally often get drowned out in the space? Has there been resistance? Yeah, there has been resistance. And what I'll say is not a great deal, but the kind of resistance that we have seen is really built into this um, capitalist framework of do it faster, have it have it be done faster, right? And what I actually propose is that in order to be truly anti-racist, you gotta be at least a little bit anti-capitalist as well, right? And the reason for that is you have to slow down. And we've all been trained, conditioned, indoctrinated into this idea that time is money. And because of that, you do it faster, you make more money, and then the engine continues to steamroll everybody, right? But for me, if we're going to do it right, we can't do it rush. And that, that's a saying that we do it, that we say at TMP all the time, right, not rushed, right? And so the resistance that we'll sometimes get is, okay, well, why does this process take 90 days? Let's, let's just name the number. Why does this process take 90 days? Well, because it takes time to get it right. It takes time to reach out to communities and interview them on what they want to see in this campaign, right? And so we'll sometimes get the response of, well, can we skip the part where we do X, Y, and Z? And they're like, well, you can, but that wouldn't be a fully raised, and that's the raised model. That wouldn't be a fully raised campaign. Or we open ourselves up to the liability that we're going to get something wrong. Right. Part of the reason that we say that we are partners and not clients, and we call the organizations we work with partners and not clients, is because we know communications, they know their issue, and we want to partner to achieve our mutual goal. Right. But inside of that partnership, some of the things that we have to agree upon are things like the anti capitalist approach slowing down, are things like it, it is important to get community feedback and you have to, again, slow down in order to get that feedback, are things like, you know, while TMP has the expertise, we will never say we can speak on behalf of a community without surveying or polling that community. So some of the feedback and uh, or the pushback that we might receive is built inside of this anti-capitalist fear that if it's too if it's slower than we're used to, we're not going to get the value out of it. And what I propose for the organizations that we work with is the value is in taking our time to get it right. You talked about this idea of being right, not rushed. And it's such, as you say, a departure from the cultural social norm of just getting things done. So often, especially in the work of anti-racism or equity and inclusion is sort of the more popular term, people always want to just do a checklist to say, we've done this, now let's move on. Let's be able to show that we did this, we put out this statement without actually doing the work. And one of the things that I appreciate about the way that you approach this work, Mercy, is really affirming the power of community, of community voice, of community experiences, and affirming the diversity that exists within those communities. And so I want to name one of the communities that you are connected to. And that is Quinnipiac University. You are a graduate of the university and you recently received the inaugural MLK Dream Award that was given to an outstanding alumni member. As you think about your journey from being a student who, as you said, had this passion for journalism and storytelling to now creating a vehicle where you can bring all of that into the world, what does it mean for you to be recognized and your work recognized in that way? Oh man, Kalila. <laughs> it's it is a fantastic honor um, to be recognized in this way. But I think that I, along with a lot of black women and women in general, but I'll specifically name black women, have a sense of the work's not done, so I can't be recognized yet. Right. Um And it is, for me, this way of taking a pause to really smell those flowers. Um, But it, it, I don't, I don't see the work as done. I don't see, I just see the work as just getting started. And I am incredibly privileged and honored that, you know, my my two-time alma mater uh, reached out and uh, selected me for this honor. Um, you were also selected for the honor for uh, for uh, the staff. And it, for me, is just this way of 
acknowledging the folks in the Quinnipiac community who have done really amazing things. And I think that every one of the honorees have, have done, are doing really amazing things, but the work isn't done. It's just getting started. And, and you know, with my team at the Narrative Project, one of the ways that I am interested in continuing to be a part of my Quinnipiac community is making ways, opening doors for communicators of color. You know, we have one of the best communication schools in the state and arguably in the country. And if I can't open doors for other communicators of color, I have done this award a disservice and I have done my work as a alum a disservice. You are a Connecticut native. You, you've talked before about your experiences growing up and really challenging the limited view that some people had of what uh, a person growing up in Connecticut, growing up in New Haven could achieve in the ways in which you created opportunities where perhaps it didn't seem that an opportunity existed. What do you say to other young people who will look to you, who will hear this conversation and say, I can do that, or I can imagine something greater than what others may see for me. What's your message to young people? Yeah, I think, and I've been ironing out this message for years because, you know, we all want to be the person that we needed when we were young. I think that my message is a, a, an Aaliyah lyric. <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, pick yourself up and try again, because success as you initially defined it might not be what uh, where you end up. Right. And that's what my entire story is about. Success as I initially defined it was being a, a foreign correspondent. And somewhere down the line, I became really hyper-focused on hyper-local news. And the idea of foreign correspondence, that was still interesting to me, but I knew that that was going to be covered. Someone else could do that. Who was going to be the person that covered the hyper-local you know, stories um, of the people on the ground in communities that were otherwise forgotten because all eyes would be on Egypt or all eyes would be on Israel, right? But right here in our own community, there are stories that go uncovered and undiscussed for a number of reasons. And so mine is a story about uh, understanding that success can come from your second act, right? Um, and keep your eyes peeled for those opportunities that might be a second act. Don't be so laser focused on that first act that you leave yourself blind and closed off to the opportunities that lead to true success in a different way. Mercy Quay is editor and columnist with the Connecticut Mirror. She's also founder and president of the Narrative Project. Mercy, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. When we return, CBS Saturday Morning's Michelle Miller talks about some of the women who inspired her growing up without a mother. This is Disrupted. Stay with us. Welcome back to Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. This hour, we're talking about storytelling and identity. Michelle Miller didn't know a lot about her mother growing up, but she did know that her mother was not the same race as her father, who was an African-American surgeon in California. When Michelle was young, her father started dating noted civil rights activist Zernona Clayton. Clayton was also the first black woman to host her own TV show in the South. Michelle was inspired by her journey, and she grew up with lots of questions about her family that she felt like she couldn't ask at the time. But as a journalist, asking questions would become her job. Michelle Miller is now co-host of CBS Saturday Morning. Her new memoir is called Belonging, a daughter's search for identity through loss and love. It covers her own journey to understand her identity as someone growing up without a mother. Ask Michelle why, as a journalist who tells other people's stories, she chose this moment to tell her own. Uh, I, I have to be quite honest. It was opportunity. Um, this is a story that everyone around me who knows it has told me to tell. But it wasn't until the uh, summer of 2020, the reckoning of the murder of George Floyd, that I was given an opportunity to be heard. Um, it was a serendipitous move by my part, on my part, that my my um, senior producer at CBS this morning 
pulled me to write a uh, retrospective of all of the stories I had done on social justice uh, that involved policing and communities of color and that that friction and the number of killings that quite frankly had uh, undermined the girth and strength of, of these communities. And in trying to showcase why 2020 and the social justice movement seemed to be having an impact more so than any other, because I had covered everyone from Trayvon Martin to um, to Michael Brown to to any one of a number of other people who have died at the hands of police. It was a it was a time that I turned the camera on myself and said, "This is why racism has impacted me in my life." It has even from the very beginning, ha- it has touched me in a way, and I I can't I can't ignore that. For you to see how I cover these stories, you have to see it through the lens that I'm looking through. And so the origin story is this: that I am my mother's secret. My my father was married at the time of my birth when he was involved in a clandestine affair with my mother, who was a Latina. She. Uh, did not receive uh, the embrace of her family, not for being pregnant with me, with me, but the mere fact that she was dating my father, who was a prominent surgeon and who seemed to would have all of the, you know, the, the right pedigree, um, yet for his race, uh, they could not accept him. And so, these are facts that I learned later in life after a search. And um, I, you know, I have some answers, I have some closure, but I don't have everything that I need. And the most important thing that I felt that I needed was acknowledgement. And to this day, I, I have yet to receive it from her. One of the things that I hear in you talking about your origin story, many people looked at 2020 and thought, if you haven't directly been affected by police violence, or you haven't directly been affected by that kind of racism, why does it matter in your life? And I imagine there were people who look at you and say, she's been successful. There's no way that racism could have been a part of her journey. And you're very clear that we need to tell these stories because of the complexities of those stories, but also how it helps people connect themselves to this broader American story. In telling your story, however, you also, in some ways, unearth other stories. Was it a difficult decision to decide, I'm going to tell this story, explore my journey and this connection, even if it makes others uncomfortable? Well, you know, it's interesting because um, (laughs) while it was other people's secret, uh, I have never hidden... I've never attempted to hide uh, in in my life this set of circumstances that I was born into, and I, I remember though, you know, there's there's acknowledgement through um, not talking about things, but 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 not omitting things, and I think that when I stepped out and stepped in or leaned into, you know, my, my cultural uh, identity was when things started to open for me in clarity, in a sense of belonging, uh, knowing full, full throttle that, that I was engaged in acknowledging my identity based on who raised me, the community that embraced me. And, and I think that that is when I felt free. So in the book, you talk about being raised by your grandmother and the sense of belonging and security that she provided for you. What was her imprint on your life as you were moving through this journey and the search? What's her imprint? I believe her imprint was uh, a sense of strength and resolve, a sense of, of mothering and um it's funny. I'm a I'm a very free per- person, but there's there's a deep resonance of stoicism within me that I'm sure I got from her. I 
I don't remember things she said. I don't remember um, a lot of that nurturing, that bonding, but, but I must have gleaned something from her because the way people describe my ability to move through my adolescence without falling into some of the traps that, you know, quite frankly, many, some of my friends did, some of my family did, um, and, and not feeling completely sorry for myself. I think you kind of pick yourself up and move forward. Um, and look, I had a blessed life, a blessed childhood in many respects. It was just, it just wasn't normalized at the time. It wasn't, it wasn't looked at as being something that was normal and okay. And I think that when we label things as, as taboo, um, because our society says that is, I mean, I was quote unquote, a love child and all of those taboo um, associations with that, you know, that there's a sense of shame associated with that. And so my grandmother was a proud woman. She was, uh, she, she never stood in a shadow and she was strong and endured and at 73 years old, decided she was going to raise this little baby and was able to raise me for the better part of a decade into her 80s until she fell ill and then couldn't, couldn't, couldn't stay with me. And, and can I just say that, that she was, so my grandmother, who went to college in 1912, pledged Alpha Kappa Alpha in 1914 and graduated in 1916 from Dallas, Texas. The fact that she rode a train from Texas through the deep South to Washington, DC. Her father was a Pullman porter and I'm sure it gave her some sort of green book uh, go-to on how to survive that long distance travel schedule and all that was, you know, I would love to, to be able to ask her what that journey was like. But think about that. Think about the woman that endured that and then was going to go to New York and indeed did start Columbia Teachers College to get her master's and then met my grandfather on a train platform. And then a year later, after writing each other, they elope. I mean, think about the the gutsy gumption of a woman like that and you know everything you need to about how I got to be me. <laughs> and how you continue that because as you said that stoicism that ability to move through also comes through in your connections to other phenomenal women and since this is Women's History Month I was struck that you talk in the book about your relationship with the great Zernona Clayton who not only has been this trailblazer in the field of communications, but also in civil rights activism, this very petite, powerful woman who now has a statue in her honor in Atlanta. And you talk in the book about her impact on you and your career in journalism and making those decisions. How have women shown up for you throughout your life to model that kind of piece of you've got to make a way even when it seems that there is no way, particularly the way that Zernona Clayton has done so. What's, what's so interesting about her is that um, I, if, you, if you see it, you can be it. And I remember as a little, little girl going into the studio with her and watching her do her thing. And that must have left an impression on me because when I went to college without realizing it, I followed a friend into the radio station and discovered, ah, oh, this is my calling. And when I explained that to my dad, he was so concerned because he felt it was pie in the sky. And he asked her Nona to talk me out of it out of this craft, out of this profession. And I remember telling her, I don't care how tough it is. This is something I love. And if I don't pursue it, then I won't be able, I won't be able to rest. 
And she looked at me and she said, to her credit, then dream big. And there are women like her dotted throughout my life who have entered and exited, but have given me something, a smile, a nod, the nurturing, the, 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 the acceptance, the acknowledgement, the education, the, the, the presence. I mean, there were, there, there are women throughout my life. And for, I mean, I remember there was a woman, her, her name was Ann Cade and she would come just to take me out to lunch once a year in her cute little candy apple red convertible Mercedes. Now imagine this, I was, she picked me up at South Central Los Angeles and whisked me off to Marina Del Rey. And we have this fabulous lunch at this fabulous smorgasbord. I think it was, I can't remember the name of the restaurant, but it was just, I felt like a million bucks. And that one instance of acknowledgement and showering of attention on a child will be remembered. You said at the end of one of your witnessing history segments that acknowledgement is power. And I hear that in what you're saying in terms of the connection to people throughout your life, but also in the book, you talk about the power of being a mother and the opportunity to build a family together so that your children, other young people will have that opportunity to be acknowledged, seen, and also valued. When you think about your journey, you think about that journey of belonging and recognition is there still a sense of acknowledgement that you seek that you didn't have before? Or have you come to terms with the fact, this is my life, this is my journey, and let me make the most of it now? I think what I want people to get from, from this book is the sense that no matter where you come from, no matter how your upbringing, your origin is labeled, you one, it is what it is. And whether or not it was good or bad, if it was it was a struggle, if it was if it was delightful, that that no matter how you walk through life, you walk through making it with those people around you and with the attitude that you you bring. And it's so important for people to understand like the now, the present, and how they create their future is within their hands. But so often we get in our own way. So often we allow the label to define us. So often we don't internalize the good times. We only remember the bad. And so what I would encourage people to do is to reassess, to take whatever strife or struggle you've lived through and understand there's a lesson in it and move forward and, and just become the best you can possibly be. Always ask for help because you need it and, and understand that women are oftentimes the best treatise to success because without them, I truly would not be where I am today. Michelle Miller is co-host of CBS Saturday Morning and author of the new memoir, Belonging, A Daughter's Search for Identity Through Loss and Love. Michelle, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Coming up, Monica Guzman talks about how the political divide with her parents influences her work to use stories to connect people with opposing opinions. This is Disrupted. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. This hour, we're looking at the intersections of identity and storytelling. For our next segment, we'll return to a conversation from last year with Monica Guzman. Monica is Senior Fellow for Public Practice at Braver Angels. It's an organization that's working to bridge the partisan divide and help depolarize America. 
Her new book is called, I Never Thought of It That Way, How to Have Fearlessly Curious Conversations in Dangerously Divided Times. Monica, welcome to Disrupted. Mm, Thank you so much for having me. Let's get right into the title of this book because there is so much there to unpack. What does it mean to have a fearlessly curious conversation, especially in these divided times? What it means is that we're having a conversation that's really driven by curiosity and we're using that mental superpower that we are all equipped with, this capacity to be curious, the 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 craving for knowledge, the desire to fill a gap between what is known and what is not known. And we're going to put that in the driver's seat. Now, it's fearless out of necessity because one of the big villains of curiosity is fear. You can't wonder about something you think is out to get you. It is easy to demonize or otherize people that we don't know, people for whom there is some degree of anonymity or distance. But when you think about it in a personal setting, in terms of your neighbors, your friends, your family members, that becomes even more challenging. And you write in the book about that political division between you and your parents and how that division really pushed you in some ways to think about these issues on a deeper, more personal level. Share that experience with our listeners so they get a sense of how you're approaching it in the book. Yeah, the the relationship with my parents is a huge animating force to my even writing this book. Writing books is very hard. <laughs> writing books in a pandemic is even harder. Uh, but But part of what really brought me to this was a contrast, a contrast between The conversations that I've been able to have with my parents, I voted for Clinton and Biden. They voted twice enthusiastically for Trump and likely will again. And you can imagine, given the divisions in our country, the depth of disagreement that exists there. And yet we were able to have the kinds of conversations where we there would be a lot of heat. A lot of people are afraid of conversations getting too heated and it makes sense. But there's a difference between heat that cooks something and heat that burns something. With my parents, we're able to have heat in our conversations that cooks something. It cooks understanding. I've asked my mother, mom, what do you think? Why do you think we're even able to have this? Because sometimes we yell at each other and yet we can laugh a couple seconds later and come back to something real. And she said, you know, Monica, I think it's because we acknowledge each other's good points. And I realized she was right. She's really good at hearing me out and saying, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way. That's a good point. And I can do that for her. So it was the contrast between that experience and what I what I hear from so many people where they're burning bridges and ending relationships over political disagreements that really feel like they're a heck of a lot more than just about an opinion. Let's add a layer to that because there are these political disagreements, there are policy debates, there are the divisions that happen over ideology within that political sphere. But when you add in layers of identity, it makes it even more challenging. And so some people may hear you say your parents enthusiastically voted for Trump twice and would likely do so again if they have the opportunity and say, but wait a minute, all of those comments that he made about people from Mexico or about immigrants more broadly, why on earth would anyone with that shared identity support him? So how do you break through that in the conversation with your parents or with others where identity and ideology seemingly collide? Exactly. Yeah, that's the question. And that really is the question. You know, I said at the top of this that it's about putting curiosity in the driver's seat. Why would someone with that shared identity still have this political opinion and still want to go in that direction. That was one of my driving questions. And I unearthed a lot of complexity, including, for example, my father, you know, born in Mexico, grew up in Mexico. Um, I talk in the book about how he would watch his own father be mocked by his friends for paying all his taxes on time. Mexico is a country where you can get away with things. It's more corrupt Um, The laws don't get enforced, et cetera. So my dad would look north at the United States and really admired the way that it could hold itself up, right? That the rules of our society are better respected. And he kind of thought like, I think I belong there. So he worked really hard (laughs) to come here. And so he hears about in immigration, there's all these laws that are not respected. 
people cross the border against the law. His his value around that that in you know that enforcement that respect for the boundaries of this country comes above his national identification with other Mexicans who cross the border. So that's one example of as a result of my kind of peering behind the scenes on that in in not a very angry way, confused, but not angry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was able to learn details like that. Where does your relationship with your parents stand now, given these sort of ongoing divisions and contentious nature of American politics? Yeah, I mean, the relationship is still really strong. Uh, when I wrote the book, they were living very close to me in Seattle area. And they've since moved to North Carolina, which is very sad for me. But um, this summer, they were here for two, three weeks. Um, you know, we prepared the guest room and made it all nice, <laughs> put candles, hope they would enjoy it. And we, you know, as we were going around the Northwest and having fun, we also had a bunch of political conversations and they were fascinating. I will say there's one conversation I have not had to my satisfaction with them, because meaning that I haven't aired my deepest, truest concerns, and it's about January 6th. We've danced around it, but I haven't really mm, plunged. <laughs> I haven't plunged in. And it's funny, right, that they were here for two and a half weeks, and I somehow didn't find the time, really? You know, so I'm I'm wrestling with that in my own head, because I think I'm a little afraid to have the conversation, which is exactly why I need to find a way to have it. As I listen to you talk about this relationship with your parents, the things you have been able to talk about, the things you have not been able to talk about, and the broader theme of this book, what I hear in your comment on this is that your relationship with your parents is grounded in love, is grounded in respect, and grounded in a willingness to see each other as humans, even if you are humans who disagree. But how do we take that to people who we don't know, we don't know personally, or we don't have that same understanding that at their core, they are good people, even if we disagree and still extend that level of curiosity and engagement to break down some of the division that we see? Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out, because I think the the, the whole course of the book, it, I was almost like too shy to kind of say, oh, by the way, it also helps to love it, it helps, right? And so it's funny, though, because sometimes deep relationships are what makes understanding harder because you have baggage. You remember horrible things they've said to you once, you know, and you have to dig your way out of those holes. Sometimes engaging with strangers about these issues can actually be easier. So I work with a nonprofit called Braver Angels, and we have workshops that bring together perfect strangers. And it's incredible the sorts of insights they can glean about the other side and politically and how deep they can get being vulnerable about their own views because there's a sort of safety in strangers. Now, most of the time when we encounter strangers, it's on the internet. And the internet is a non-place that makes us into non-people. It's far too easy to believe that what we are really doing is engaging with an opinion. There will be listeners who are hearing our conversation and thinking, this sounds great in theory, right? It sounds wonderful. Be willing to be honest in your views, be curious about others and engage. And then they will remember a January 6th, or they will remember a kid who's sitting in a classroom where parents are debating about which books they get to read or you know whether social emotional learning is this nefarious force mm -hmm. or if it's something that's good. And there will be that fear that sometimes words can be dangerous, that words can be harmful in ways that is not like the little kid adage about sticks and stones, right? That those words stay. When we're thinking about what we're facing today in this country, and I'm, you know, as an educator, I'm particularly concerned in that context. Is there a line, Monica, where you say, you know, every idea doesn't need to be validated or mm -hmm. every perspective doesn't need to be engaged because it could cause harm? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I guess I'll start by saying I don't think it needs to be an either or. I think that there are fighters who need to fight without doing a lot of listening to the other side that they feel is just against them. I think that that's part of a healthy democracy. People holding up the slogan and not wanting to ask a lot of questions. They're at the center of communities of belief and they can really change the world. And we've seen it and we'll keep seeing it. I think what they need is people at the edges of those communities of belief, extending a handout, 
you know, and reaching for people who are curious or skeptical and being able to engage in a way that doesn't just mean I'm here to persuade you and pull you in. I understand that I also need to be open to your concerns and where I might enrich my perspective and my community and the person at the top of the hill holding that sign by learning from you. Even though you are opposed to my cause, there might be some truth in your story, even though there might be no truth in your conclusions. So I deeply believe in that. Now, are there some truths that, that, you know, are there some perspectives that should not be validated? Sure. But I don't think there are people who are not validated. That's the difference. So there are people who hold terrible perspectives who are still valid people. And I think we can approach them that way. I'm not a, I'm not validating an idea by talking to you and getting curious about you. I'm, but I am understanding that you are a valid person and that one way or another, we have to contend with each other because we share this space. You're an author, but at your core, you are a storyteller. And a storyteller who has use the power of story to promote this human connection, to encourage people to see the humanity in others and be able to engage in that goodwill. How do you think that genre, that approach of storytelling informs this book and what you want readers to take away from the book? Mm. Yeah, I remember debating with myself and some others about how much of my personal stories to share in the book. And some people, you know, really told me, ah, I don't, I feel like you shouldn't do that. You know, lean on, lean on everything else, try to find someone else who says stuff. And, but there was so much, um, there were so many sort of concepts that I just felt like if I share the story, I think it'll really hit home. And so then I also had folks saying, yeah, you've, you've got to do that. So I ended up really leaning on story. The, the thing to take away is You know, next time you're in a conversation, any conversation, notice what happens when you switch modes from arguing syllogisms or logic, rational stuff, to somebody going, you know, it's like that time a few years ago when I was in this bar, and they start telling a story. And notice what happens. If it was a tense conversation, everyone relaxes. Your brain goes from, you know, thing versus thing, and like that little crunchy kind of way that you think about stuff, into a place of imagining. You start to visualize this person's story. They walked to a bar, they saw this person, you know, you start to picture it. And so the magic of storytelling is relatability. You don't have to explain why you connect with someone's story. It just happens. One of the biggest tips I give in the book is, is just that. Make yourselves storytellers as you're trying to explain. Like the story I told earlier here about my dad, right? Watching his father's friends mock him for not paying his taxes on time. I can see it in my head. I wasn't there. (laughs) but when he told me it made sense like a lot of things made so much sense so when you ask people from their stories rather than than their opinions you're asking them to give you a tour rather than putting them on trial and it's a completely different tone you can you can bond a little bit in that moment in that conversation and it'll help you reach harder topics Monica Guzman is Senior Fellow for Public Practice at Braver Angels. She's author of I Never Thought of It That Way, How to Have Fearlessly Curious Conversations in Dangerously Divided Times. Monica, thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much for this conversation. Disrupted is produced by Kevin Chang Barnum, Emily Cherish, Wayne Edwards, Meg Dalton, and Katie Tularski. Special thanks this week to our interns, Melody Rivera and Elizabeth Van Arnhem. You can listen to all the previous episodes of Disrupted by finding us wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for Disrupted and Connecticut Public. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Thanks for listening. <laughs>